What breakthroughs do you think uh, we might have in your space in the next few years that'll make headlines? It's a really key hope for somebody like me is that we will start generating data sets with the algorithms in mind. And I think we're starting to get to the stage where people are thinking, how do I generate data that really drives machine learning algorithms? The majority of the antibody is always the same shape. So if you use a standard loss function, you might not actually collapse to the correct structure because you just get most of it right. I'm really interested in the bits which we're getting wrong currently because the rest of it I could have predicted anyway because they're all the same shape. Charlotte Dean, welcome to the Super Data Science Podcast. I'm so excited to have you here. You are an absolutely brilliant guest. We've had so much excitement from the audience that you're going to be here. Hundreds of engagements on social media, tens of thousands of views, and now it's happening. Charlotte, welcome. Where in the world are you calling in from? So I'm sitting in Oxford, which obviously is my favorite place to be in the whole world. <laughs> Especially in the winter, I bet. Oh, it, it, it's, com no. <laughs> it's very cold here today. Um, oh, yeah. Um, yeah, I, uh, some listeners who have been listening for a while would know that I spent five years in Oxford doing my uh, PhD, or as we actually uh, properly call them, a DPhil, but I seldom mention that. That just generates more confusion. Um, and yeah, I, on a nice day, it is actually paradise, uh, on a wintry day. <laughs> no, I mean, th there are far, far worse places to be, but it, it isn't a warm place to be right now. Nice. All right. Well, we've got lots of deep technical questions for you. So let's jump straight into those. Um, let's start with your recent role that you took on at Excientia. So you're chief scientist of biologics AI, which I understand is a newly created role for you. Um, and so let's start with uh, that word biologics. What does that mean and how does AI relate to it? So um, maybe step back slightly. Excientia is a company that's sort of made its name about using AI to do small molecule drug discovery. And everyone's very comfortable that they know what a drug is. <laughs> It's very slightly about what we mean by the word drug there. But biologics are just another form of drugs. But instead of thinking about small chemical molecules, we think about proteins. But in particular, the easiest one to talk about is antibodies, because everybody's heard of those now because of the pandemic. So antibodies are natural in your system, but they can also be developed into very, very successful forms of drugs. They're the most successful kind of class of drugs currently um, for treating lots and lots of diseases. Um, so that's the biologics bit. And really, this whole job was created for me to start building off what has been done in AI for small molecules to see how mm -hmm. far you can pu push that so that you design using AI to make these much larger sort of protein like molecules. So the antibodies and things like that. Wow, that sounds super interesting. Um, yeah, so you're focused on applying artificial intelligence in general, I guess. Uh, if, if if we can define artificial intelligence neatly, uh, machine learning and other kinds of computational statistical techniques to do things like uh, predict protein structures, uh, allowing Excientia to discover and develop new drug candidates, right? Yeah, exactly that. And it runs right through from, I, th I like the way you said all the different techniques, because people always talk about AI, but what you really mean is <laughs> using the data we have in with all the tools now at our disposal. Right. And that runs from some really quite, I don't want to say standard statistics, but it is through to really quite complex AI techniques in deep learning. And the idea is to take that as far through the process as we can. How much can computation speed this up, make it easier, make it less expensive so that we get better drugs that are more effective to people faster? Yeah, um, this is something that actually I spent a lot of time thinking about in my PhD. Um, so uh, in my Oxford PhD, I had a collaboration at the University of Edinburgh where uh, we were developing machine learning techniques. I should say the Edinburgh people, they were the really smart AI people. Uh, and so they were mostly developing the techniques and then I was applying them to real world data. And uh, so we were trying to identify uh, causal pathways uh, in biological organisms. So um, uh, genetic data are interesting because uh, we're not aware of a mechanism by which uh, the world around DNA can, um, can impact 
DA, DNA in some systematic way. So that means that we can uh, infer that if there's a correlation between some genetic pattern and some biological pattern, that the biological pattern isn't causing the DNA sequence changes. And so you can use that information to then have, uh, to look at multiple correlated biological molecules and using conditional probabilities say, oh, it seems like um, biological um, molecule X is impacting Y as opposed to the other way around because of the way that the genetics impacts it. Um, so I don't know, I have this like, I mean, this is stretching back 10 years ago. <laughs> so if you quiz me on anything, I'll probably do terribly. Um, but that kind of area, this idea of uh, using biological information to try to find drug candidates is something that I guess 10 years ago, I was thinking about it for a bit. So um, do you have any like interesting case studies? I mean, obviously you can't go into proprietary things that you're doing at Excientia, so, but yeah. Yeah. So I, I mean, I should say, obviously I have two jobs still. So yes. I'm CSO at Excientia, but I'm also a professor in the Department of Statistics at Oxford. Yep. And so I can talk some about our work there, but they're obviously related. So uh, the easiest um, recent example to talk about is when you mentioned that concept of protein structure prediction. Everybody has heard of AlphaFold. Um, it made quite a lot of noise about being able to predict protein structures. Mm -hmm. We've done a lot of work on if you want to predict the structures of antibodies, you might want a model which is instead of being general for all proteins, you make the model specialist for antibodies. Mm -hmm. And the reasons you want to do that, I mean, there's sort of the obvious reason, of course, if you can specialize a model, you might be able to make it more accurate. But it's also about the types of data you have available to you. So you can change the way you restructure the model. Um, some of the things that become important in this are things like um, we don't use some of the functions that are used in AlphaFold, so we can go much faster. So it's much, much more rapid. Um, but the, the sort of interesting internal machine learning parts of this are thinking about how you use the loss function, because the majority of the antibody is always the same shape. So if you use a standard loss function, you might not actually collapse to the correct uh, structure because you just get most of it right. right. And that's fine if you're alpha fold because, you know, you're mostly getting most proteins right. Whereas I'm really interested in the bits which we're getting wrong currently because the rest of it I could have predicted anyway because they're all the same shape. And the bit which is different is where the binding happens. So you want to refocus the way you use these types of functions to do that kind of thing. So it's a kind of... That kind of work. So this is a paper we've put out recently. If people look at it, called Immune Builder, but it's using those kinds of ideas about how you take the data in, how you use your loss functions, and it um, actually changes the kinds of results you can get, or how you focus your kind of computational work. So, do you kind of start from scratch if you know if you know some of the structure? Does that mean that you can kind of have this is like I'm probably mixing terminologies here, but uh, in Bayesian statistics, we have like priors. And so do you kind of have like that kind of prior information that you can provide to the model? So this is a, an actually interesting. And it, when we built our first versions of this, we built something which is called Ablupa. And effectively, we did provide it with here is the right answer for the majority of the structure. And I just want you to predict what are called these complementary determining regions, this difficult bit to predict. And that is really fast, actually. That's the fastest kind of prediction software we've written. We then went on to test, well, what if we let the model predict the whole thing? Because it will find it easy to predict the main part. And we play with these ideas about lots of functions. And that's where we moved on to Immune Builder. And I still don't completely understand why. We have some theories of why. But the second version is more accurate, right. even though we're asking it in inverted commas a harder question. Right. Now, it might be because it has better control of the overall function, because it, it's not set up like a prior here. You actually just literally provide it with the information of what this piece is, and that has to fit onto that. And that's possibly why this happens. Right. But it turns out, even though it's sort of an easy question to answer, and it slows us down in terms of making predictions, you make a bit better predictions if you do the whole thing as one concerted prediction inside these types of methods. Nice. So then is there an easy way to explain without having to have <laughs> a whiteboard or other kinds of visuals for our audio only listeners? Uh, is there a way to kind of intuitively explain how we can set up a loss function to handle this, this situation that you're describing where we know some of the structure and we want to give clues to that part? So it, it's almost like not giving clues to that part. It is changing the weighting of the loss function. 
So in some sense, you know you're going to get that bit right. So if you imagine, I mean, this is explaining it very poorly, I'm afraid, but if you imagine that if you had a loss function that said, how good is my overall structure, then it kind of drops straight down very quickly because the overall structure is really good. Yeah. And then most of the changes it makes as it's trying to learn don't affect improving the CDRs. Mm -hmm. So the loss function doesn't move. Mm -hmm. So the bet that was predicted badly doesn't improve as much as you want it to. Whereas if you reweight the loss function, so the set of atoms that you know you're going to get right, you actually don't give it much reward for doing right. so. Because even if you did barely train for that, it sounds awful, it will get them right anyway. Right. So it's basically balancing out the parts. Another part of the loss function we found, which was good to be able to do, was this idea of actually you could make the loss function less strict. Um, and there are various reasons behind this um, compared to the way AlphaFold was trained. Some of it is because however strict you make the loss function in terms of trying to make the ideal structure, you never actually make something that's physically completely accurate. So you always have to do a bit of physics on the end. You do a sort of bit of minimization right. to make all the bonds and angles. So you can waste, it sounds weird, waste less time trying to make it get really great bonds and angles because you know you're going to run this kind of minimization on the end. So you have a, a loss function that's sort of slightly different there as well. Very interesting. Are you unit testing your machine learning models? You certainly should be. If you're not, you should check out Colina. Colina is an ML testing platform for your computer vision models. It's the only tool that allows you to run unit and regression tests at the subclass level on your model after every single model update allowing you to understand the failure modes of your model much faster. And that's not all. Kalina also automates and standardizes your model's testing workflows, saving over 40% of your team's valuable time. Head over to Kalina's website now to learn more. It's www.kalina.io. That's K-O-L-E-N-A dot I-O. Um, do you, and so this is gonna show how little I know about antibiotics. <laughs> um, so, are antibiotics formed by a single uh, strand of amino acids or are there several that have to fold together? Okay, so you want to say antibodies when you ask that well. question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, that's right. Uh, I wrote it down in my notes wrong immediately at the onset of the... Uh, I'm trying to make an effort to always be listening, but also jotting things down yeah. to have a great summary <laughs> at the end of the episode. And sometimes I'll do things like that. Yes, the antibodies, please. <laughs> so... Um, the actually a true human antibody is like a giant Y shape and is made up of four chains. But the only bit we really focus on for all of this is sort of at the, if you imagine the very tip of the Y and you have two chains at that point. So there are two chains of amino acids and we will call them, they're called the VH for variable heavy and VL for variable light. And this makes it sort of adds a level of complication because, of course, one of the most important things to predict is how they orientate with respect to one another mm -hmm. because the binding site is sitting on the very tip of the Y. So it's like the end, it's like sort of the bits of both chains pointing out together make the binding site. So a small change in angle between them will change the binding site a great deal. Nice. And the binding site is critically important because that's what's actually doing the work inside your body, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, so that's what will bind to your target of interest. So if you're trying to make this a drug, that's what needs to bind to the protein you want it to bind to. That's what needs to hit the target, whatever, those kind of things. Yeah, so I've managed to completely fluff my lines already in this episode, <laughs> and it gives me the idea that maybe we should take a step back on the idea of antibodies and antigens and explain that to the audience. <laughs> okay, so I, I this, now we're, we're in my, my sort of favorite territory. Whenever the easiest way to think about this is you would all be dead if you didn't have antibodies in your system. So that's a good way to start. <laughs> they are one of your major lines of defense against um, invading molecules in a natural system as a, as a human. Effectively in your body, what they do is when a, there is a, some form of infection or some non-native protein, yeah, what your immune system does is it raises antibodies against that that bind specifically to that target. So if you have caught flu recently or had a cold or had COVID, you've probably had at least one of those in the last few months because most people have, mm. um, your antibodies have reacted to that infection and by a process, it's, it's a, like a serious set of mutations. They mutate very, very rapidly, find ones that bind very specifically to that protein and 
there are various different immune mechanisms, but basically they mark them out to be destroyed so your body knows that it's non-native in some way or block them from functioning. The average circulating diversity in your body is about 10 to the 12 different antibodies. Um, that's wow. an estimate. Might be a bit less, but this gives you an idea of the numbers. Might be a bit less than that, but something like that. Different sequences of antibodies in the human naturally kind of circling around. The estimate of the actual diversity possible is somewhere in the 10 to the 14. So, you know, these are estimates. So there might be a factor out here or there. Yeah. So when you're trying to design an antibody, what you're thinking about is I need to make something, and this is really important given what I've just told you. If I inject a protein into you, even if it's an antibody, if it isn't a human antibody, your own antibodies will go, ah, kill it. <laughs> <laughs> yep, because that's what they're really good at. Right. So it won't be very effective as a drug. And it could also cause you to have a massive immune response, which isn't very good for you. Mm. So we want to operate within that natural set of antibodies, all these human antibodies, and find ones that will bind specifically to targets of interest. And the really cool thing about antibodies is they are incredibly good at this. So you can do it with laboratory experiments. You can always, I mean, I, I should say almost because, you know, there's bound to be exceptions, but it is incredibly easy in some sense to find antibodies that bind specific, spine to a target because that's what they do because they've got this huge sequence diversity and ability to do this. The problem is to make them good medicines, they have to both bind to the target bind where you want them to, to the target. There's no guarantee of that. Be human so that they will actually be safe inside your body. And then a load of other properties, which are more about being able to manufacture them. Mm. So the easiest one to imagine is if I want to make something into a medicine, I've got to keep it in a bottle. It's a bottle in a fridge right. for an antibody. So they mustn't aggregate because I mustn't inject you with aggregating protein either. That's very bad for you. So there's a whole set of these kind of conditional properties that you've got to work out whether a sequence will have. And also you have to work out how do I, on a computer, design an antibody that will hit that site. Wow, that sounds really fascinating. All right, so let me try to, uh, to summarize back for the audience in my own words some of the key points here. So um, your body is full of a very large number of antibodies, uh, 10 to the power of 12, uh, roughly, that are floating around. And so they can conform to all manner of different kinds of shapes. So you're saying that all the kinds of possible shapes that they could, could conform to were a couple of orders of magnitude more, something like 10 to the power of 14. So you've got all these antibodies floating around just looking for random shapes <laughs> to attach to. Um, and um, those random shapes could be things like a coronavirus particle, a specific part of it uh, you probably know off the top of your head. So, like like a, the receptor binding domain. That's right. kind of the one that's uh, or on the spike, you know, those kind of things. Yeah. 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 Those are the kinds of words that <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I know those are around. <laughs> um, so uh, you get a little bit of spike protein from a COVID virus that you've never had before. And your body is very likely to somewhere amongst those millions and millions. Of, oh, yeah. Go well, ahead. it may not even have one that binds already or binds particularly well. Ah. So what happens is because it's got that much diversity, one of those may or may not attach. And as soon as something does, your immune system goes through this process of it's called somatic hypermutation. So things that bind weakly mutate and it keeps things that bind stronger and stronger. So it's like a self-proliferation system of improving binding in your immune system. And then the, I suppose the really cool thing, which I didn't say is after you've had an infection, antibodies that bound something useful are kind of kept in a sort of memory bank. So when you get the same thing again, exactly the same thing again, or a very similar thing, and this is really how vaccines work, you have antibodies that are ready, not thousands of them, so it has to up and make lots of them, to already bind to it to get rid of it. Nice. Okay, yeah. So that fills in a few more gaps. So uh, you, you have an antibody that could weakly bind, just kind of bind to this new... COVID spike protein that showed up in your body for the first time. And then as a result of that weak binding, your body goes through this somatic hypermutation process that creates very rapidly lots of mutations close to that spike protein shape that it weakly bound to. And then we're likely from that process going to end up with something that does bind very well. Um, and then I guess once that happens, then you have some separate process that scales up. So it says, yeah, yeah. And it basically, I, I mean, the immune system is really complicated, but it's this <laughs> idea that as 
as things bind better to a foreign invader, more and more of it is made, but the making process contains this sort of error system in it, the somatic hypermutation. So then you get better and better binders through that process. And then it, it what's called in your memory of your B cells, you store the kind of things that you've had previously. So of course it's there when you get a new infection, something that this will bind already really quite well. So the process is much faster. So if you imagine when you get a vaccine, what they're doing is effectively giving you nothing that is dangerous about what's in a disease, but some example proteins from it, they won't really do you any harm, Mm -hmm. but then it can learn how to bind to those so that when you actually get the real virus, very quickly you respond and can clear out the disease. Nice. And then I guess you're also well prepared for slight variations um, on that, say, COVID spike protein. So uh, the first time that your body encounters it, it's quite a foreign shape, um, whether it encounters it for the first time from a vaccine or from getting uh, an infection. Um, But then in the future, even as the coronavirus mutates and has slightly different spike proteins, you'll be better prepared yeah. Or because you're more likely to weakly bind. Yeah. Yeah. And the, but one of the things that makes this complicated is, of course, um, how long that kind of memory lasts in your immune system. Because mm. that uh, and once again, you know, I'm not actually an immunologist, but this varies or seems to vary for different diseases in terms of how long it does that. And this is only one heart. I mean, there are lots of other parts of your immune system, but the other part that's really important in this is TCRs. But, you know. Let's not go there yet, but they operate in a similar way, but they do it for proteins that are inside the cell and there are other complications. But it's a, it, it's the same kind of thing about recognizing non-self as fast as possible. Mm-hmm. And then once you have recognized non-self, you can do this. So that's how the sort of natural system is working. And the idea in making them into biologics is quite often what we want them to bind to might even be a self protein. Say, for example, if you're targeting cancer, you know, your own immune system tends to not target cancer right. because actually cancer is self right. primarily or you're self-replicating something too much in your own body mm-hmm. or it's very close to self or there are reasons why your own immune system is not doing something. So what you then have to do is ha- you outside, you know, in a lab, obviously, you're trying to generate an antibody that will bind to that. Yeah, so that brings up a really interesting point. So, you, so we'd up until this point in the conversation, we'd been talking about the biologics, these big drug molecules that you're focused on synthesizing and studying. And uh, so we all of the examples that we covered up until this point were with respect to antibodies. Um, and, but you just also mentioned there the really interesting case of uh, cancer, which is a different kind of problem for... I, yeah. But, he- But the point is here that you use what we do is we design antibodies that will bind to say a specific protein in cancer and then they become a therapeutic. So my design problem is to design the antibodies against a now a disease target. And the reason that we know they're so effective is that our own, you know, our own immune system shows us that antibodies work (laughs) because that's how they work. And so what we have to do is work out one, how you replicate that first in a laboratory experiment, which is what most people have done up till now, and what I'm interested in doing, which is how do you replicate that on a computer such that I can design the antibody that will bind to the the target that you want it to hit. Gotcha. So um, so these biologics, it, it's very much state of the art. We're not, it's not something that is widely used in humans today. Oh yeah, no, they're, in terms of biologics, I can't remember exactly. I think probably seven or eight of the top 20 drugs are biologics. So they're very widely used for lots of different diseases. There were several antibodies that were um, anti-COVID antibodies that were that were used. Um, and many are used for things like cancer treatments and that kind of thing. I think one of the things to think about them in terms of treatments, though, it's, it's kind of the important distinction because people get very excited, is that unlike a small molecule, to deliver this, it's always going to be like an injection or an IV drip because it, you can't take this as a pill because your stomach would destroy a large molecule of this type. So uh, you're only going to design them for quite serious conditions because, you know, right. I probably don't want to have to go and have an IV drip every time I have a headache. But yeah. I would be quite happy to do that if I was a little more seriously ill. Right, right, right. 
Yeah, so I'm beginning to get the impression that I personally have not been administered any biologics. <laughs> I'm going to go for a no. It's a, they're, they're mostly for quite serious conditions. You know, there's a lot of them targeted at um, some various cancer types. That's probably the, the biggest space they've been used in. There's a few now. I mean, there are COVID antibodies that um, were used for, particularly for people who were unlikely to raise their own antibodies against COVID, so oh, people who had other conditions to so help them there. Um, and there are some for some other diseases as well. Can they be personalized to an individual's cancer? Uh, I think the answer to that would be yes, because you're designing for a specific site. So, I um, mean, I think that would be, I have, to be honest, in terms of antibodies themselves, I don't think that's been done. Biologics more generally, which, you know, I could, it's sort of opens a massive can of worms if I go too far, but there are things particularly, so I mentioned TCRs earlier, certainly with those, there is work where people personalize those to be used as particular um, medicines for an individual. Um, so you take samples from an individual to make, create a medicine that might help them. Right. Um, that sounds uh, like something that could be super promising in the future. I imagine it's the kind of thing that today is extremely expensive. I think it is both expensive, but also quite slow today. And I, I guess that's one of the reasons why I'm so interested in the computational methods. If you have to experimentally work out what you're going to do, that takes time. Right. And, and so, I mean, time costs money as well, but that is almost more serious if somebody is seriously ill. Right. Taking six months, nine months, a year right. to get the right medicine is probably not the, right. I mean, not optimal. We've got help. It's coming. Yeah. <laughs> Just sit tight. <laughs> Best treatment ever is going to be here in a couple of years. <laughs> yeah. Just and, I mean, yeah. And, the, and I, to be honest, I don't know how far those kinds of treatments have got towards actually being, you know, a, a licensed treatment, but there's definitely work where people are doing that kind of specialized, um, trying to make them personalized in that way. It's very interesting. So, uh, so even though, uh, these kinds of uh, biologic administrations via IV are relatively rare and only done in serious cases. They are nevertheless, you were mentioning a sat there of something like them being, uh, you know, the half dozen of the 20 most, uh, yeah. most. Yeah. Yeah. I don't, I mean, I can't remember the exact yeah, numbers, but, but they are a massive class of. Um, they're not rare. And they're not rare at all. No. And some of it is because they can target some of these like, you know, I'm, I, I can't think of the polite words for it, but basically diseases that are very serious. Right. So, and another reason for this is also, I mean, and this is kind of another reason why I want to do this on a computer is that they're expensive to make currently. So, so it's a, once you know what small molecule you want to make, it might've been very expensive to do all the research to get to that small molecule, but actually small molecules are quite cheap to manufacture. Mm. No, it's not like, totally right. zero, right. but it's not that expensive. Whereas biologics, to actually make them at the end, you have to basically express them in cells. That's how you make them. Mm -hmm. So you're imagining a massive factory to do this. And so they're considerably more expensive to make. And as I said, you know, this is a biological molecule, so you've got to work out a way of keeping it safely as well. So they're a much more expensive type of medicine. And that means that that limits their use. But of course, it can make them very profitable for very important diseases and things that want to do. So it's really important to work out ways of actually making them cheaper to discover in the first place and cheaper to make once you're doing that so that you can really use them in more places as well. Got it. Want the best possible start in machine learning? Super Data Science's top instructors, Kirill and Hadlin are back creating courses and have released a brand new machine learning course that will give you that perfect start. It's called Machine Learning in Python Level 1. From their experience teaching machine learning for over six years and collecting feedback from their 2 million plus students, they know exactly what you need to be quickly on your way toward ML expertise. You will get crystal clear explanations of introductory machine learning theory backed by practical hands-on case studies with working code. Enroll today at superdatascience.com start and get ahead of the game. Again, that's superdatascience.com start. So if we don't use data and computing to try to find these molecules, how do you do it then? You're just kind of guessing, right? Yeah, I mean, well, you do it. it well, there are sort of two main ways to get these molecules. And um, 
The first one, um, the squeamish should not listen to the next bit. Because the most obvious way to do this is to use another animal's immune system. So I've just described how good we are at it. So what's the best way to raise an antibody? Well, one way to do it is, um, and actually what's done commonly here is there are mice now that exist, but mice would be a good example here, where we've, in inverted commas, humanized their immune system, because obviously I need it to be human, not Mm -hmm. mouse. Mm -hmm. But you could just use normal mice and then you have to work out how to humanize it. Mm -hmm. And then you inject the animal with very large quantities of whatever it is you want to raise the antibody against. Um, Obviously, that's for step one. And then the the way to describe this is then you have to harvest the animal's immune system to see what it's done. Or you have to take lots of extract samples from the animal to see what antibodies it's raised. So what you're doing is using the natural immune system of, say, a mouse to identify antibodies that bind to your target interest. So that's one way. Um, the other way is really the best way to imagine this, and it's kind of the way I want to think about doing it on a computer, but you do it as an experiment. What you have is a massive library of antibodies. Usually we'd say something like a phage display library. And what you've done is artificially made yeast cells, for example, doesn't have to be with it, but that's the easiest way to describe this. And each one expresses loads of one type of antibodies. They've all got different sequences. Now, these libraries can get quite big. So this is a big experiment you're running. So imagine you've got this and then you flood it once again with your thing you want it to bind to. So I would say the antigen, the thing you're trying to get. And then effectively you find all of the cells that bound to it. So now you have some binders. And then what you do is you sort of refish. So you take those cells, you make, you make them do mutations in a similar way to in the body. But obviously this all ends up being a bit smaller scale mm-hmm. because the numbers to be able to do these experiments are smaller. And you repeat that experiment until you get binders to your target of interest. Right. So the phrase I use is before you do it on a computer, the way you do it is you go fishing. Because right. effectively what you do is you go, here's the antigen, fish in the pool. Oh, I've got something that sticks. Excellent. <laughs> right. And in order to do that, so you've got like, uh, you've got like a million different kinds of lure. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, that will get stuck to a very specific kind of fish. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, got it. Okay. So yeah, so that's the traditional way of identifying biologic drug candidates. Uh, but then as we kind of kick the show off, uh, we can use data machine learning AI, uh, to be able to predict, uh, what the drug candidate would be so that you're, I guess, maybe fishing from a much smaller pool or do you, are you sometimes you're just able to say, that's the fit. That's like, we've, we've got the, we know exactly what the right lure is for this particular kind of fish. I think the answer there is can't do the second one yet. Want to get there in the end. <laughs> right, right, right. So at the moment, what you're trying to do is, what, what you want to do ideally is for somebody to say, this is the target. This is the thing that is disease causing. And I want you to produce an antibody that binds to that. And I'd love to just be able to effectively put the target into a computer program mm. and it would give me the sequence of the antibody that would bind. Right. Okay, that's the that's the big, you know, end goal. And there are lots of pieces you need along the way to be able to do that. You know, things like thinking about um, understanding the structure and shape of the antibody. So what shape will it make? As I change the sequence, it will change the shape and that changes whether it would bind or would not bind to my target. What we are really at the stages of doing now, and this is what everyone's doing, is working out how can I make those experiments much, much more efficient. So given I have a small amount of data about what might bind weekly, for example, could I work out things that would bind much more strongly? And the other thing about this and retain all those other properties I mentioned earlier about, you know, it's got to be human. I don't want to inject you with something that's not human. I've got to be able to keep it in a bottle in a fridge. So that there's a lot of physical properties it must have. Um, you know, I want it to express really well. So that's that question about manufacturing it. If it doesn't express well enough, there'll never be enough antibody. It won't make a good drug. So you kind of have this big multi-optimization problem that you're trying to do as you do this. And I hope it's fairly obvious to everybody, big multi-optimization problem. What I want is lots of data that describes these kinds of things are human. These kinds of things um, will be able to be kept in a bottle these kinds of things mm-hmm. express well. Mm-hmm. Yep. How do I feed all that information into an algorithm such that it makes good decisions about you know, what you should do? And in one sense, at the moment, what you want to do is connect that to a lab so that 
you have algorithms that make good decisions about what you should test next in the lab to learn as much information as possible um, to design the antibody better and better to bind specifically to your target of interest and keep all those properties I've just talked about. Nice. So uh, it sounds like there's lots of fertile ground here for your research for quite a few years to come. Um, so why is it that people like Demis Asabis, and I'm probably mispronouncing his name, and given how long I've been hosting the show, I shouldn't mispronounce his name, but let's go with Demis <laughs> Asabis, uh, the Google DeepMind CEO. Uh, he recently claimed that their AlphaFold algorithm had, quote unquote, solved the protein folding problem. But in talking to you, it seems crystal clear that we're nowhere near it. <laughs> I think, well, I have to be careful here because I was at dinner with him last night. So I mustn't be too rude. <laughs> yeah. How much, how was, much did I butcher his name? <laughs> a bit. Um, so he, he gave a lecture in Oxford. He was doing the Cavley Prize lecture yesterday in Oxford. And then um, a group of us went out to dinner with him afterwards. And I think there's a, well, there's several things I should say. The first one he knows I would say, which is I don't like the phrasing of solving the protein folding problem. Right. So that is the sort of, way people talk about it. Actually, what AlphaFold does is it solved protein structure prediction. And it hasn't even completely solved that. And he wouldn't say it was completely solved either, but it has sort of. And what that means is if you have a sequence, what AlphaFold does is tells you what the endpoint structure is. What is not clear, and I mean, my group's done some work on showing this, is it doesn't actually know how it folds to get to that structure. It's like it's learned the end points. And that's really useful. So I don't want to do it down at all. I think that's an amazing achievement. It's an incredible piece of software. But what it has done is moved us from a realm where we thought doing this kind of structure prediction was really difficult to a realm where actually a lot of the time you get it very right. Yeah. The problem is that, and maybe I should have explained this a bit better when we were talking about the structure prediction at the beginning, antibodies are in inverted comment. well, no, just sort of slightly different in the whole way that they mutate and change from standard proteins. So the standard proteins in your body, most people are comfortable, you know, they evolve through time. So we have, let's take hemoglobin is a really good example. You know, things making your blood red, carrying the oxygen around your body. We have hemoglobin. Yeah. So does every other mammal. Sperm whales have hemoglobin. Their hemoglobin looks quite different from ours in terms of sequence, but the shape is the same because it's carrying out the same function. So what it's evolving to do is maintain that function so the sequence will change, but the structure is staying quite stable. And AlphaFold makes use of that when it does its predictions because it takes in as its starting point this uh, sort of multi what's called a multiple sequence alignment. So if I talk about hemoglobin again, it would take in the hemoglobins from all of the different species. But of course, it's what it's predicting is the structure of one of those, but the information from all of those is helpful because they're all roughly the same shape. Mm -hmm. In fact, more than roughly the same shape, they're very much the same shape. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Antibodies are not evolving in that way. Mm. They're deliberately evolving to change the shapes of the loops on their surface to bind to different things. Right. And so AlphaFold is actually, I should be fair here, AlphaFold multiple is actually really rather good at predicting antibodies. But the sequence alignment probably doesn't help it very much because... <laughs> It's taking in information that is, if you imagine these loops make one change in sequence and it completely changes the shape that you observe there, and that's what they're meant to do. And they're not really evolving. They're undergoing somatic hypermutation driven towards specific targets, which are different for each antibody. But we would align them all together because globally, most of the sequence is very similar. It's just these loops that are really making big changes. Right. And so one of the reasons in our structure prediction program, we don't use a sequence alignment. Now, one, that allows us to go much faster, but two, because the antibodies don't evolve in the same way as, you know, a standard protein, it's probably non-informative, at least to a you know, much greater degree to use that. So it's this, I, I think, you know, that's the first stage. The second stage, and this is something that, you know, he was talking about yesterday, is of course, we're kind of at the stage where we've solved maybe this is the individual units. So if you think, well, the antibody's already got two chains, but we haven't really solved the problem of this kind of interactions thing, which is the bit I need to solve, which is how does the antibody interact with its target? And that's the next stage on. And I think it's something they're obviously thinking about too, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, about mm -hmm. 
you know, in the general sense, how do you predict if two proteins will interact with one another? Because that's not a, um, it's not always interacting. It can be transient. So it binds and then it comes off again, binds, comes off again. So how, how do you predict that and what systems do you need to do that? And there's actually some really exciting research papers coming up about trying to do that kind of prediction at the moment. Yeah, that is exactly what I was going to ask about, ask you about next. Um, and so before we get to that uh, kind of 4D prediction problem, um, to, to really quickly kind of explain why uh, antibodies are, I, I mean, I'm, I'm going to try to <laughs> paraphrase back to you uh, what you said, and then you can explain to me why I'm wrong. Um, so with things like hemoglobin, across lots of different species, there's this kind of convergent evolution towards a particular so it's the other way around. It's a divergent evolution. If you imagine there was an ancestral mammal that had hemoglobin, we all have hemoglobin and we're all divergent from there. Ah, uh, got it, got it, got it, got it. Um, but uh, because it's so efficient, it stays mostly the same across yeah. all these different um, ancestors. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I was thinking about it the wrong way. We're like, we've all separately evolved. Uh, yeah, and the, and there are examples of convergent evolution, but primarily this is a yeah. divergent evolution thing. Right, yeah. right, right. That makes sense because it would obviously be a lot more rare for that to happen just by chance. <laughs> um, uh, but then with antibodies, uh, with the tricky bit, and uh, say the name of the tricky bit again. In, I say CDRs. It's complementary determining regions. CDRs, which sort of makes sense because it's what determines their binding. So complementary determining regions, but CDRs yeah, yeah. is what people call them. And so those, so we can't. So the the kind of trick that you were describing of having all this information from lots of different species on how hemoglobin uh, sequences correspond to hemoglobin shapes, that isn't. Uh, very useful information in the case of antibodies because these CDRs are deliberately trying to be as diverse as possible. And you were using that kind of 10 to the power of 14 number. There's so many different possible orientations. And so you, you end up with just so, lots of sequences where you're like, I don't know, like, how can we predict what shape this would make? Because we haven't seen this before. Yeah. And the, they don't have that relationship where it's keeping that shape is useful for their function. So if they all bound to the same target, then they would all have the right. same shape. And in fact, <laughs> that's a trick that we use when doing prediction. You can have very different sequences. If we know they bind to the same thing, they probably have the same shape, even with antibodies. But generally speaking, antibodies all bind to different things. Right. So they all have a different shape. You know, it's a kind of, it, it's sort of obvious as you say it out loud, but it's a difficult, it changes the way you might write the software and think about how to use the data. Super interesting. All right, so now let's go back to that 4D problem. So <laughs> this is, I'm so glad that that it is something that we have some research on because it's something to me that was immediately fascinating when I read about the AlphaFold 2 successes earlier and how it had done so well at predicting 3D protein structure. In my mind, then I was like, well, yeah, the next big problem to solve then is going to be computationally much more complex, is going to be this 4D problem of how does this 3D structure change over time as it receives um, the antigen that it binds to, or that, as, it, as it does, and I guess that's a specific to antibodies, but uh, as the protein does work, how does its shape change? Um, so, the, yeah. so this is one of the interesting things, actually, antibodies are one where if this is not so much of a problem, mm. well, we don't know that for definite, I should be clear here. All of the evidence suggests that antibodies, when they bind to their target, when they are very affine, so when they bind strongly, which is when we're interested in them, their shape doesn't change very much at all. Mm. Yeah. So, and the reason for that is uh. sort of pure physics energetics. So if you have to change a lot on binding or have to fix your conformation on binding, there is a, usually an entropy cost for doing that. So if you're rigid and already in the shape you need to do binding, it's easier to have you know, a higher binding energy because you're losing less energy to do the binding as well as that which you gain. Whereas there are examples of other proteins which do change. Now, there are some antibodies that do change on binding, just to be clear. And it's not, as, it's not completely like a jigsaw piece. So some of it is moving, the side chains will move, there'll be changes in conformation. But interestingly for antibodies, that actual change in shape is for things that are strong binders, it is thought because we don't have complete evidence, but um, 
it's not so much of a problem. Nice. Okay, I got it. I got it. I got it. Um, um, well, it's still <laughs> it's still interesting <laughs> to me that yeah. uh, that this this will be. Um, yeah, as, as you said, you know, people at DeepMind and I'm sure and other groups are thinking about this 4D problem and how we can be, uh, you know, yeah, adapting algorithms yeah. to be able to handle these shape changes. Um, and uh, yeah, I guess we keep being surprised <laughs> by how quickly problems get solved. But maybe that's one of the oh, yeah. few um, years. <laughs> I, I think, I mean, I, I mean, it's been amazing over the last few years how quickly all these types of problems have been solved. And I think one of the interesting things here in terms of a lot of this is thinking about, you know, what problems we could still solve where we actually do have, if you like, the data that would allow us to solve it, as well as, you know, it's a well-formulated problem. And it's the, right. you know, the way to think about it is where DeepMind showed their first success was on games. And the reason they picked games, and they're very open about this, is because games are a multi-optimization problem. That's what machine learning is really good at. With well-defined rules, machine learning likes those. Mm -hmm. And with a way of being able to generate or have lots of data that describes the entire space you're going to work in. Mm -hmm. And so it's interesting to think, particularly in terms of you know drug discovery, biologics, but also in all sorts of other areas, what problems fulfill those requirements? Because many, many that we would like to do don't. And so then it becomes either we need very new techniques to solve them, or we need to think, how do we define the rules such it would be helpful? That's usually the biggest problem, the rules of the game. Or the data is the other really huge problem that people miss out very frequently here. Actually, the volume of data required, and it's not just lots of data, it's data spread well across the space you want to search. If you only have data in a, like a tiny area of the space, none of this will work. <laughs> You know, it doesn't, it's very difficult for it to learn the rules over here, you know, miles away if I've only got data, just a little circle around a tiny point over here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I see what you're saying. And then so, um, uh, yeah, we obviously need really good training data for any of these models to be possible. And to have really well-defined uh, data to work with on these 4D problems would be very hard to come by and extremely expensive to create. Yeah, and I think people will think about other ways to think about that. So you might use lots of simulated data from using physics simulations, for example, or other ways to attack this. So I, there, it's like you've got to think about what machine learning is good at. If that's the, I mean, I, you know, if that's kind of your preferred hammer, and then work out can you set the problem up such that a hammer will work, or are you just no, don't use a hammer right now. Think of something else. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, this. There's probably some way that I'm thinking about this incorrectly, but I imagine in a situation like that where you're trying to uh, do physics simulations of 4D structure, of course, if you could do those physics simulations perfectly, <laughs> you'd have already solved the problem. So <laughs> that is that is almost exactly it. That's that's a, 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 a that is actually a phrase I use quite a lot when people go, "Well, it's all right. We'll run the simulations and then we'll train the machine learning model to do them." And I'm like, "Well, if the simulations worked, I wouldn't." I mean, you still. You still might train the machine learning model because it might be a lot faster. Mm. So you, know, you can make an argument that that's a good thing to do because it's much quicker. But if you know that the simulation is incorrect, you have to decide, is it worth training something that gets to me the wrong answer much faster? Right. Or is it correct enough that I might be able to use it to help me generate the types of data that will make good models for doing this kind of thing? So there are kind of positives I can put on this, but it's a bit more nuanced than just yeah, if you can simulate it, then you could train it, and then we'd answer it. As you say, if the simulation's wrong, it's not quite clear what you've trained yourself to do. Right. So for this 4D problem, it sounds like a thorny one that we'll be tackling for a while. Um, what breakthroughs do you think uh, we might have in your space in the next few years that'll make headlines? I think, I mean, we will see, I think we'll see lots of things and you're sort of starting to see them in research papers already because the field's moving so fast. I think we will see in the next few years, you will see biologics that are designed on a computer that make it through to clinical trials. I think that's coming. There's already one company that sort of talked about doing that, but they designed only part of their molecule, but they did design some of their molecule in it, you know, going through to clinical trials with it. And I think we, so I think we will continuously see the rise of the computational technique being the driver of the experiments that are chosen to be done and then the driver of what happens in the clinical trials. Hopefully that will translate into lots of other good things in terms of drugs becoming easier to make and more available. I think um, we will 
start to see, and this is something, maybe this is a hope rather than I know it's going to happen, but I think it's a really key hope for somebody like me, is that we will start generating data sets with the algorithms in mind. So in my space at the moment, the data we have is this historical data that people have collected because they were interested, say, in a specific antibody or a specific target, and Mm -hmm. they published this. And you collate all that together and try to use that to train algorithms. But if I was designing a data set, those are not the experiments I would have carried out. Now, experiments are expensive, you know, and they're hard. So, But we're moving to a much more roboticized setup of all of these types of things. So I think one of the things that we will see, and it will change the kind of types of algorithms we can even write, is if we collected the right data in the first place. You know, it's a bit like... um, Lots of my colleagues in this department, you know, they're statisticians. And one of their biggest complaints is when somebody turns up after they've done all their experiments and say, can you do some stats on this to show that this is significant? And it's like, well, I could have done if you talked to me before you ran the experiment. It's quite hard now to do anything with your data because you set that up kind of as you thought about it, but not something that was computationally or statistically would would allow me to make those kind of statements. And I think we're starting to get to the stage where people are thinking, how do I generate data that really drives machine learning algorithms. And that, I hope, what we will see is the big breakthrough is that will be a virtuous cycle in the sense that once you do that, the algorithms will get right. noticeably better, then the data collection will get noticeably better, and you will really, you know, you'll see an ex- a massive acceleration in what's achieved, I think. Nice. Super cool answer. Um, so we have uh, talked about COVID in this episode. Um, but something that, uh, well, you and I haven't talked about yet, though listeners might remember from uh, my introduction uh, to the episode, which uh, I record separately from our conversation, Charlotte. Uh, Some of our listeners might recall that you were recognized with a queen's honor uh, when you were appointed member of the Order of the British Empire, so an MBE, which is a tremendous honor uh, in the UK, uh, and you were awarded that for your key role in leading UK's response to COVID-19. So um, how did everything that we've talked about so far today, how does, how, how does all of the science that we've talked about today, all the machine learning that we talked about today relate to the way that you are able to uh, respond to the COVID pandemic and make an impact in the real world? Uh, so in some ways it's separate and in some ways it fits together. Uh, so. Uh, my stuff was because it was for helping UKRI, so the UK's Research and Innovation Council, set up their kind of very rapid grants response to allow people to apply for money, both in industry and academia, to, to do research into COVID. I happened at the time when COVID hit, in inverted commas, I was working for part of UKRI. I was deputy executive chair of what's called the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council. And I was asked to, if you like, lead this sort of stream of work to be able to get these grants going, which is very rapid grants to people to be able to fund COVID research. And I think some of the reason I was asked to do that was because there are a very, very small number of, if you like, academics or people with academic background inside UKRI, and they span the whole discipline. So some of them are, you know, historians, some of them are social scientists, those kind of backgrounds as well. Right. It's a very small number of these people, and I'm one of them. And I was one of the few people who worked in a field which was quite close to the area in the sense that this is a virus. I knew a little bit about antibodies, a little bit about drugs, a little bit about, you know, actually, you know, I suspect if we'd had a true kind of I don't know, probably more useful if it had been an epidemiologist in some way (laughs) sitting there. Um, But really, in a way, a lot of my science wasn't the most helpful thing there. It was everything else. And it was this kind of my job there was to have a broad enough understanding of science, to try and get the right people together to work on these problems, to try and make sure that we were funding, quickly funding lots of research projects on relatively short timescales and persuading my colleagues they have to make their results available immediately. This isn't about publishing a paper. You can do that. This is about telling us what you know now, even if you're not sure. You know, the first time in my life, the sentence, no, people will die if you don't do this, actually meant something. Right, 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 right. And so th- this was more about that kind of organizing, coordinating, persuading the world to behave. And by this, I mean the scientific world to behave in a different way 
in terms of responding to what was needed in terms of research for that. So really, it was that part of my, my life. And it was it was a very different experience, I have to say, not something I ever thought I'd end up doing. Right. Yeah. A lot of us didn't see the pandemic coming. <laughs> um, but yeah, amazing that you were in the right place at the right time and able to play that key role in UK research and innovation. Um, were you able to at least, I don't know, was there some kind of data or data analytics element to the UKRI response? Uh, it was, I mean, I would say it was almost all of everything that I heard about was about data analytics. <laughs> okay. Just, it was a huge part of what was going on. Yeah. Um, it, so uh, if you think about obvious things, that I'll, I'll use one story as an example, and it's almost a silly story, but it's a really good way of describing this kind of thing. One of the projects that we funded very early on as UKRI uh, was a project where you could test wastewater to see what viruses were in it. Oh, now, that's yeah. a known thing. Yeah, yeah? Yeah, yeah. So, But could we test it and find out how much COVID was in an area? as opposed to having to get loads and loads of people to do COVID tests, persuading people to do testing. And some areas don't want to, you know, some people were more adverse to testing than others. So of course, if you just look at numbers of people who have COVID based on COVID tests, right. it's not actually a very good representation of what's happening across the population. Right. Because some people over-tested, some people never tested, you know, and it was easier for some people to get tests than others, you know, all the obvious things. And so that data, there was a lot of work to try and make that clean and how you deal with it. Whereas here, what you got was data from the sewage plants. I, you know, I, I love this kind of the whole concept is just it has this element of humor to it. So I really like the whole grant in this sense. And it turned out to be really accurate because what you would see and actually sewage plants are relatively local things. So you knew if there was a major COVID outbreak happening in a part of the country, sometimes ahead of any other data. But also this data was very unbiased compared to a lot of other data because you know, it didn't depend on lots of the factors from others. So we could use that data and overlay it with data, say, for example, from COVID testing or from, you know, other incidence rates that we might have or from hospitalization data. But most importantly, it could do things like warn you because it would tell you there's a large amount of virus. And I'm sure most people are aware there was quite a long time between people catching virus and people actually being seriously sick. And so you could start to prep the hospitals in an area saying the numbers are clearly high in your area, even if you can't see it right now. Right. Sewage plant says yes. <laughs> yeah. And that's a really kind of, you know, a, a sort of, I think, a really good real world example of where thinking about where your data comes from, thinking about your data sources, thinking about how you get unbiased data. And then, of course, you could do every kind of other test to lay over it. But it also helped us to you, how do you normalize the testing rates that are going on and work out how much COVID is actually happening in different places. So I didn't do any of the calculations for this, but I was helping to make sure that these projects all talk to one another so that you actually had those kind of numbers available for people to make decisions and think about the best ways to use that data. Right, it's super fascinating. Um, and what would, what's the British TV show that you just made reference to by saying, so there's the, that computer says no, skip. <laughs> that's oh, the, understood. like yes wow. the computer says no that's in i can't even remember but yes it's a comedy show i don't think i've never watched it i think it's just something <laughs> it's, i can hear everybody knows but that's <laughs> yes. it, but it is wastewater says yes um yeah. <laughs> uh and there's an interesting to me this whole area of using wastewater to uh to investigate uh what's going on with covid that also that's kind of being done regularly with lots of different kinds of diseases and just kind of uh, community health uh, issues yeah. in general, right? Yeah, it's. I mean, I, I have to say, before I was involved in this, I had no idea that wastewater was used in this way. And then when this project was suggested and colleagues who worked in um, what's called NERC, so that's the sort of environment funding part of UKRI were like, this is a really good idea. And, you know, we're talking it through. I said, And they talked about other things that are, have been measured within wastewater and it's good because it's it's no kind of personal information attached to this right, right, right. No, exactly it, it's a kind of i don't know it feels like a really good way of doing a lot of these things because you can see something that should be is helpful for the health service to know about and for people you know to be able to look after people well mm -hmm. but you're not invading anyone's privacy because well literally it's the sewage from everybody right, in the area exactly so, you know <laughs> So, tells you nothing apart from the area. This is a situation where somebody saying that your research is crap means it's quite a good thing. 
Yeah. <laughs> I uh, think it's a, it was one of the most excellent in that sense. Um, and there was also, I, um, I had to quickly look up on my machine here uh, some of the details, but it, this reminded me that a lot of the early epidemiological work in the Western world revolved around detecting cholera. Um, so someone named John Snow, I've looked up here, yeah. uh, detecting epidemics of, of cholera and discovering that, lo localizing them to, um, to wells. And so it seems it's, it's, there's, it's related here in a way is basically people were pooping and it was getting <laughs> into the well water and then people were drinking the poop and <laughs> that's where and it was that, cholera that, that was the issue. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But here, as opposed to nobody was drinking poop, I hope, I hope there was no poop drinking. But instead what you're saying is you can, what you'll be able to see by measuring something yeah. kind of, um, is where there is a hotspot and that's for epidemiological modeling. That's really helpful because it tells you how some, now it, it's not detailed enough data, but once you have that kind of data, of course, you can then work out what the testing means in that area. Yeah, yeah. Because if you only have negative tests in an area where the sewage system is saying, actually, there's a lot of COVID, you realize that you must have a lot of population that's not testing, for example. That's, you know, and so you can build that into your epidemiological models as you try to work out what's happening with the spread. Yeah, it's going the opposite way around. With the cholera thing, it was like, oh, wow, these wells are really important. In this case, we're saying, okay, we already know <laughs> this is where we should be looking for the problems. Um, yeah. Um, so uh, fascinating, fascinating research that we've covered uh, in this episode. And I've learned an absolute ton. Are there any particular kinds of data tools or software or techniques that you use regularly or you're excited about that you think our listeners should be aware of at home? I guess I start from this that I have no hammer. I have questions I want to answer. So I get excited about loads of different techniques. Um, there are new techniques that people are getting really excited about in terms of sort of deep learning methods for the kind of problems we've been talking about, this binding problem. So there's a lot of excitement around diffusion models at the moment, you know, and things like, um, I like it because it's a beer name in my head, IPA. Um, <laughs> So those kinds of models. I think one of the big things that also is becoming very powerful in kind of biological data in general is the natural language models. So people might have seen the models that come have come from Facebook, where they've been building these giant natural language models that seem to be, I mean, they're a really interesting way of representing sequences and then what you can do with those. I should say that I always want to say that something that's really important to remember is that this is the basic statistical techniques are often really powerful to start with, that forgetting to check what your data tells you just by, have you just checked if they correlate? You know, and it, it always sounds a bit silly, but I start with the kind of, those are really important in what we do. And then these really cool methods allow us to extract more information or potentially pull in more types of data into a single model to be able to make these more complex predictions. So yeah, it just keeps going. And I, I should also say, I think that if you ask me in three months time, there'll probably be newer techniques because the field is moving so fast mm -hmm. at the moment. Um, yeah, this is something, so I, in the last few years, actually starting in the pandemic, um, I started creating a lot of content, uh, particularly on YouTube, on the foundational knowledge of the data science field or machine learning. So things like linear algebra, calculus, yeah. probability theory, statistics, um, and like fundamental computer science concepts. And as I dug more and more into that, I was blown away at how many uh, complex problems can be solved with very simple linear algebra <laughs> or yes. yeah um <laughs> yeah i mean another thing that we found recently is a lot of um machine learning papers don't bother to work out what a kind of boring baseline would be right. so if i used a really standard technique how well would i do at the problem as i have set it up here because we have discovered quite <laughs> often that for many of these methods the boring baseline is almost as good as the machine learning fancy fancy thing right and if that's the case don't do the fancy fancy thing because right, 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 <laughs> exactly. you've got a lot more parameters so i i feel really strongly that it's important to understand all that underpinning stuff so that you can actually make good choices because there's real power in these really complex algorithms but we should know when it has real power and when it's effectively just a very fancy toy for sure um so I'm sure there are a lot of listeners out there who are 
excited about the kinds of problems that you're tackling, how would somebody, what kind of background would they need to have to be either working with you at Oxford University or at Excientia? I think, I mean, I guess the background is is very variable. If I, I, you know, it's sort of easier to talk about my research group, but it varies from people who study, you know, things like biochemistry and chemistry, study computer science, mathematics, engineering, statistics, physics, all across the board. Um, and that's partly because I work at the interface of all these areas. Right. The skills that, um, you know, I want them to have as they develop through my research group in some sense is actually to do this, you have to enjoy programming and get pretty good at it. You don't have to be the world's most brilliant programmer, but you've got to be happy on the computer and you've got to want to program a computer and play with that. And then the kind of things that, you know, I want them to be good at is really this excitement and interest in the problem, because this is a hard problem. Working on this, you will spend a lot of time doing things that don't work. And so if you're not interested in it to a <laughs> very large extent, it's really quite depressing at that point. Mm -hmm. And being able to be independent about how you think about it. So independent thinking is really important. Um, and I think there's lots of different potential hard skills. As I said, you know, it's really useful if somebody understands tons of immunology. In fact, you know, some people who join my group know more of that than I do because I'm not trained in it originally. And then I have others who come in who are really qualified, if you like, on the mathematical side and can really explain the algebra that's underpinning a lot of these machine learning algorithms. So I think there are many different ways in, if you see what I mean. It's yeah. like, but it, primarily it's about, um, for me, it's you've got to want to work on a computer because that's what we do and be comfortable to, to do that. And yeah, accept that lots of things we try won't work. Yeah, I like that. You have to enjoy programming, failure, and be an independent thinker. Um, <laughs> That's a great answer. Um, everyone always says communication, so I'm glad you didn't say that. <laughs> well, I mean, <laughs> it's not like that's a bad thing. It's nice to get some other answers. Uh, <laughs> you know, I could say I want them to be someone who's good at working in a team because that's yeah. true and all sorts of other things. Yeah, right. But, you know, let, let's be honest. Failure is quite an important thing to enjoy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I like that. Um, and um, so we also, we had, as I mentioned earlier in the episode, we had so much engagement when I announced that you'd be coming on the show and I asked if people had questions for you. Uh, we had a lot of comments, <laughs> somebody named Kirsty Allen. I don't know if you know her, she's a program manager. Uh, she said that you're not only incredibly intelligent, but you're also funny, which I've uh, been able to enjoy. That's, that's that, so... Kirsty and I, I, I do know her, not spectacularly well, but we have met and worked together a bit in Oxford. Um, so yeah, nice. that's quite amusing. <laughs> uh, and then, um, so Adam Sroka, um, who works on AI platforms in the energy sector, uh, his comment was that you're literally the definition of a super data scientist, which is... Uh... Now I'm very embarrassed. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh, and then we did also have a question. So um, Matthias uh, Baudino, he's a business intelligence analyst at a company called Brain Technology. Uh, and he said, what an amazing guest. I wasn't familiar with her work until now. I am very intrigued about AI in structural bioinformatics. And I know that this is maybe uh, beyond Charlotte's area of expertise, but can this kind of machine learning models, uh, so structural bioinformatics models, can they help us understand the kind of life that can be formed on other worlds. So can we use structural bioinformatics to make predictions about aliens? I guess my starting point is, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> there are people who have for a long time worked on the concepts of what could other forms of life look like. Um, so one of the questions is whether you can have a form of life which isn't carbon-based. Right, right, right. So there are many really good reasons why carbon... Silicon-based, right? Would be yeah, silicon-based life. Yeah. Yeah, those kind of things. I watch uh, Star Trek. I know. <laughs> <laughs> and there are people who work on even understanding how we got to sort of complex organisms. So, you know, did we start in an mRNA world rather than a protein world? So right. it was mRNA actually the first thing, and then mRNA created DNA and mRNA created proteins, those kinds mm -hmm, of things. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I would sort of guess, and this really is a guess because we're quite a long way from what I know about, but if we obviously, if we understood much better how our proteins worked, how they bound to one another, you know, basically how we ourselves work in terms of human life forms and sort of natural life on earth, 
I would suspect that would massively help you to understand what would be a potential forms that an alien life form could take, because it, it would be a much better understanding of the space that, if you like, human life sits within. But really a long way away from anything I really know about, so I probably shouldn't have made any comment at all. <laughs> nice. Well, let's jump back to something that you know quite a bit about, which is cycling. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not yes. kidding. Uh, so for many years, uh, your team at Oxford, your research lab has been organizing a cycling tour that you call Le Tour de Farce. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so you enjoy cycling a lot and it seems like your researchers do too. Uh, how did this come about uh, and do these kinds of social activities help with scientific discoveries? <laughs> so the answer to the second one is definitely yes. Um, because... Yeah, going back to that, I didn't say communication, but um, being relaxed with the people you work with, able to talk to them about it, being unafraid of making mistakes in front of them and being able to discuss with them in a broad scientific sense is always going to improve your output in that sense. It's really good to be able to talk to people in that way. The Tour de Farce, so a long time ago, um, my group have always known that I like cycling. Um, if you're watching this on video, you will see that my Brompton is behind me <laughs> on the floor there. That is one of my six bikes, just to be clear. I really like cycling. And my research group knows this. And so a student of mine called JP asked if I would be prepared to work out a cycle route we could take. Now, Oxford has a lot of pubs. You will know this, John. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, a cycle route we could do where we would cycle around Oxford and stop at pubs on the way that would be short enough. And so it's a bit like a pub crawl, except right. we do it on bikes. And that is how the Tour de Farce was born. And it was meant to be this sort of one-off thing we did because it would be, you know, I was like, yeah, yeah, I can work that out. So we did this. Well, we didn't even cycle that far, but it was kind of fun. And it was on a beautiful summer's evening in Oxford, you know, the long summer evenings you get. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we stopped off at a few pubs. Some people drank beer, other people drank water. You know, it's quite a normal evening, had a really good time. Um, but it very quickly became clear this was not going to be a one off. This was going to be something that my group did every year. And yeah, it's one of our, well, certainly one of my, but I think the rest of the group also enjoy it, favorite events of the year. It sounds super fun. I wish I was there in Oxford to enjoy. I heard that the Eagle and Child closed or something like that. Is that? So, no, the Eagle and Child is still open. The lamb and flag which was the pub opposite uh, so that was actually shut for a while it is now reopened oh. so a group of people in oxford opened it effectively i mean sort of like a community pub so a load of locals now own um the lamb and flag cool. and it's back open again and they've redone all the if wood paneling inside it so it's very beautiful nice all right i look i look forward to checking that out um did you know uh jonathan flint who was at oxford for a long time uh I don't think I did. No. Yeah. Well, then the rest of the story isn't going to be very interesting. <laughs> uh, so we'll just skip that one. He was uh, he was my doctoral supervisor, and he is in episode number five forty seven of this podcast. Uh, but uh, I had a story about him cycling uh, in Oxford and <laughs> it ending really poorly. But uh, <laughs> we're we're running out of time, and so I'll just skip to asking you instead if you have a book recommendation for us. <laughs> So uh, my book recommendation is a book that actually I sort of picked up by accident in a bookshop um, because it had a title I liked. It's a fiction book. It was called Lessons in Chemistry. And I don't know if you've heard of it, um, but the book is set. I can't remember exactly when, probably sort of 1950s, 1960s, that kind of time. And the concept of the book is that the central character is a lady who wishes basically to be allowed to do research. Mm. But given the timing, you can kind of guess that there are many problems with this occurring. She is working in a research lab when you first meet her. And the book is very funny. This is something I should say. Um, but the, the amazing thing about it is I suspect that male or female, if your listeners are people like me who really like science and, you know, kind of thinking about things in a scientific way, they will really like the central character in this book. She's very, you basically, if you are at all of a scientific bent, you are rooting for her from the beginning to the end of the book. Partly because, I sort of don't want to spoil it, but in one sense, she sees the world in a very particular way, which means that she's not seeing what's happening 
in front of her. You know what's happening, mm -hmm. but you also feel like that's kind of the way that most scientists also see the world. <laughs> so I felt like, yeah, I know what she, you know. And it, the book is amazing. I think it's the best way to describe it. And there have been other people. I mean, I discovered after I had picked it up and read it that it was quite well known and lots of people had read it and seen it before. Nice. Well, it is the first that I've heard of it. And I think it's the first time it's been mentioned on the show. So that's a really cool recommendation. Sounds like a lot of fun. Charlotte, this has been an amazing episode and it's mind-blowing. We've gotten right to the very end now and we haven't had a single retake, which is pretty rare. This has just been one continuous flow of wonderfully interesting conversation, at least for me. Um, and so I'm sure there are lots of listeners out there who would like to be able to follow your work after the program. Are there social media channels that they should follow you on or, or how can they keep up uh, to the latest on your work? The easiest way to follow me in an academic sense, which is probably the best way to see what I'm up to, is I'm not really on Twitter myself, but my research group is. <laughs> my research group is called OPIG, Oxford Protein Informatics Group. But our Twitter handle, because obviously the group is OPIG, so they are the OPIGlets. So our Twitter, <laughs> <laughs> if you can find the OPIGlets on Twitter, that is us. And the other place to see stuff I'm doing, if you want, is on LinkedIn, because that's where I put some of the stuff. But mostly follow the OPIGlets. Nice. And they'll tell you what I'm up to. We'll be sure to include the O-Piglets in the show notes. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, Charlotte, again, for taking the time. It's been such a great episode. Uh, and yeah, maybe in a couple of years, we can check in with you again and see how things are coming along. Uh, I'm sure you'll have plenty more to fill us in on then. Thank you. It's been great to speak. <laughs> Holy crap. What an extraordinary episode. In it, Charlotte filled us in on how biologics are big drug molecules like antibodies that help our immune system recognize foreign material. How personalized cancer medication is quite slow today, but how data and machine learning are dramatically speeding biologic drug discovery and perhaps soon personalization. How AlphaFold 2 predicts protein shape well in general, but antibodies have especially tricky complementarity determining regions that aren't yet automatically solved across the board by any computational approach. She also talked about how data analytics was central to the scientific response to the COVID pandemic, such as epidemiological studies of wastewater, and how undervalued simple old correlation is as a data science technique. As always, you can get all the show notes, including the transcript for this episode, the video recording, any materials mentioned on the show, the URLs for Professor Dean's social media profiles, as well as my own social media profiles at superdatascience.com slash 643. That's superdatascience.com slash 643. If you too would like to ask questions of future guests of the show, like several audience members did during today's episode, then consider following me on LinkedIn or Twitter as that's where I post who upcoming guests are and ask you to provide your inquiries for them. Another way we can interact is coming up on March 1st, I'll be hosting a virtual conference on natural language processing with large language models like BERT and the GPT series architectures. It'll be interactive, practical, and it'll feature some of the most influential scientists and instructors in the large natural language model space as speakers. It'll be live in the O'Reilly platform, which many employers and universities provide free access to. Otherwise, you can grab a free trial. Hopefully, catch you then. All right, thanks to my colleagues at Nebula for supporting me while I create content like this Super Data Science episode for you. And thanks, of course, to Ivana, Mario, Natalie, Serge, Sylvia, Zara, and Kirill on the Super Data Science team for producing another epic episode for us today. For enabling that super team to create this free podcast for you, we are deeply grateful to our sponsors, whom I've hand-selected as partners because I expect their products to be genuinely of interest to you. Please consider supporting this free show by checking out our sponsors' links, which you can find in the show notes. And if you yourself are interested in sponsoring an episode, you can get the details on how by making your way to johncrone.com slash podcast. Last but not least, thanks to you for listening all the way to the end of the show. Until next time, my friend, keep on rocking it out there, and I'm looking forward to enjoying another round of the Super Data Science Podcast with you very soon.